Greetings. Should I put a little more growl into it? <laughs> okay, I came yeah. back to, we spent 48 hours making puppets. So. <laughs> making and breaking hearts, Ellinger. It's not that kind of podcast. On a practical level, <laughs> I have to remember what I was saying on a practical level. We should have a safe word. <laughs> Armageddon! I guess we're maybe semi-proud of that. Welcome to Hide and Create, your online writing workshop. Welcome to another episode of Hide and Create. Uh, we have Jordan Ellinger, Joshua Esso, Moses Siragar, and a special guest, John Klima. That is Hello. how you pronounce it, right? Correct. Okay, good. John Klima, who is just very well known in the community of the science fiction and fantasy community as a short fiction editor, award winning, and generally awesome guy. And we're going to pick his brain for all sorts of stuff about short fiction markets. So, glad to have you, John. Glad to be here. All righty. So, now, what's the secret? What's the secret handshake? Right out, out with it. <laughs> uh, you have to have your thumb on the outside of your hand oh, uh, so it can touch your pinky. <laughs> okay. But if you can't do that, all you have to do is write great stories. Okay, I'm trying that now. Oh, it's very difficult. <laughs> yeah. a Freemason sign or something? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to uh, ask something real quick, though, before we get too much further into this. I was wondering, John, if you could actually tell us a little bit about electric velocipede so that you know everybody is up to speed with exactly what you do. Sure. Um, I'll give a little bit of a history about myself because I do like talking about myself. Um, <laughs> I, I started working in publishing in 93 with uh, Jim Frankel, who had moved out to the Midwest, and I interned with him while I finished up college. And Jim is an editor at Tor Books. And uh, I had that revelation of, wow, you get paid to make these books? Like, <laughs> that's so cool. So then I moved out to the East Coast to get work in publishing. And I worked at a couple different places. Uh, ended up at Asimov's Analog uh, as far as science fiction periodicals go. And from there I moved on to Tor Books. Um, unfortunately, as many authors know, publishing for many people, is not a well-paying industry, uh, so I moved on to other things, but I missed doing it. So in 2001, I started Electric Velocipede, which is, I guess, a speculative fiction magazine. I have some fantasy, some science fiction. If you think more along the lines of someone like Jeffrey Ford or uh, uh, Kelly Link or Catherine Valente, that's the type of thing that I publish. So we started as a print, a staple and fold periodical, that I literally assembled by hand with the help of uh, my wife's co-workers uh, to a perfect bound full color cover uh, concept. I won the Hugo Award in 2009. Um, I've been nominated four times for the World Fantasy Award. Oh. And uh, in last year, this gets kind of mushed together now that I have kids, the days just fly past. <laughs> um, last year, we went online. So now the magazine is only online. Uh, part of that was in 2001 when I started the magazine, uh, I never even considered going online with it. But now I probably would never start a print magazine unless I won the lottery. Um, <laughs> so it's online, sort of in the same place that you have Lightspeed and Clark's World and Beneath the Skies and Daily SF and all sorts of other uh, wonderful magazines. And um, we're still doing... About two issues a year. This year we're going to try to put out four. Um, we're kind of mired right now in the midst of copy editing the current issue that I wanted to have come out in uh, March. So we're running late on that. Um, I don't know when this is going to air, so we could be even much later. <laughs> um, and I've, I've published stories from people like Jeffrey Ford and Jeff Vandermeer. Uh, I was the first person to publish short fiction from Catherine Vellante. Uh, I published Rachel Swirsky early in her career, uh, people like Elliot de Baudard. Um, I've published Ken Liu, like everyone else seems to be publishing his great stories. Um, this is definitely like a who's who of short fiction, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Name dropper. <laughs> well, no, yeah. I mean, I can think of, you know, quite a few of those people have gone on to do quite well in novels. But many of them are very famous for their short fiction. So, John, what if, well, since, I mean, you do seem to have found so many of these really amazing writers who've gone on to really great things, what was it about their stories that really um, pulled, you know, pulled at you? Um, and no, you can't just say they wrote a great story. Right. What was it that they did? The thing that I always try to tell people for Electric Velocipede is to, to write something different. 
and I tend to pick up things that are different, maybe different from what that person has written typically before, or just kind of different from uh, what's out there. If you read uh, the Jeffrey Ford story, which is online in the magazine, um, called The Way He Does It, which is a whole story talking about the protagonist and the way he does it. And you never learn what it is, but it's amazing. And people travel and they visit him and they want to see him do it. He does it on stage. Uh, and that story actually got nominated for the World Fantasy Award. And that's very kind of like the uh, apex of what I'm looking for is something like that. You know, it's just a little bit different and it's got things that don't quite make sense. Maybe it's hard to quantify because the stuff that I publish are the things that I like. So if you write a story that's got stuff in it that I like, then you're good to go. And sometimes that's hard to explain to people because I'm the only person who knows what my tastes are. (laughs) But now that you've got a couple issues online, you can go and kind of see what we've been doing um, to get a sense of what I'm talking about. So in that story, you never find out what the it is? Nope. That's great. <laughs> That's kind of awesome, yeah. Yeah, it's not a very long story because you can't support something like that for a long uh, amount of time. But that's one of the great things about Jeff is that he can take something absolutely absurd and you just go with it. And you're like, okay, fine, you know, there's a floating cat head. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the market situation has changed a whole lot since I used to um, submit short fiction. Back when I was doing it, it was basically analog, Asimov's, uh, fantasy magazine, and then a few little scattered ones here and there. But that was pretty much before uh, the Internet uh, really took over, not took over, but uh, became an active participant in the short fiction market. Uh, how do you think this has changed short fiction in general? Do you think more people are writing fiction, or do you simply think um, – it's diluting it, or what do you think? I think more people are writing it and publishing it. I think there are, uh, you've kind of always had a lot of markets. It's a little bit easier to find them now than maybe in the past because you could go and find good online magazines and read what they do and then write a story for them. I mean, you, but you look at something like uh, this year, the, the 2013 Hugo ballot, and there are three stories on the ballot. Uh, because you need to have at least uh, is five or six percent of the total nominations. So there are a lot of stories out there. People are reading a lot of stories and, uh, you know, we don't have enough of a consensus, I guess, on them, at least as far as the awards are going. So there's certainly plenty of places to find things. Well, yeah, I, so that, I noticed that too. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Moses. Yeah, there are only three short stories that met that minimum requirement. Uh, it's a, a, I don't remember what the percentage is. I could probably go look it up, but it's either five or six percent. But there have to be three nominees on the ballot. So, so potentially they don't, just take, they don't just take the top five, basically. <clears throat> yeah, they take the top three at least, and then the top five if they all meet that percentage uh, criteria. So potentially only one story or no stories could have met the five or six percent criteria, and they just huh. take the top three nominee getters. Now I don't think that's the case, and you won't see those uh, numbers until after the Hugos are announced at Worldcon because that's when they then put out the numbers for the the nominations because they don't want you to feel like oh well no one nominated that story so I won't vote for it so that way everything is kind of a level playing field right now. And that makes sense. I think that the internet um, has done for short fiction what it's done for every other form of media and basically it's fragmented it you know like i mean when we were young mm-hmm. we had i had three channels right uh, tv channels right now there are 500 so if you like science fiction you watch the sci-fi channel if you like comedy you watch the comedy network etc 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 and i think that because of the internet it's lowered the bar to entry for short fiction magazines so you know, v- literally anybody can start a short fiction magazine tomorrow um, and, and so if you want a particular kind of short fiction, you can go to those magazines, right? So mm-hmm. I, I think that's part of what John is saying, that there, you know, it's, it's not like everybody's watching three channels anymore. You know, like a, a smaller percentage is watching a larger variety or reading a larger variety of short fiction. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you have a magazine like Daily Science Fiction that puts out a new story on Monday through Friday. If you were printing that... You'd never even think of doing that. You couldn't approach a newspaper and say, hey, can we have a science fiction story in your Monday through Friday edition? Um, so having an Internet magazine 
lets you do something like that, which is really cool. And then I end up, I subscribe to it, and three months later, and I have, you know, 90 unread stories. I say, oh, okay. I have to unsubscribe and come back to this again later. But <laughs> Yeah, my well, magazine, be- every, sorry, my magazine, Everyday, Everyday Fiction, has been doing that for, like, five years now. Same mm-hmm. thing, you know, every day. Right, we're not a pro market because holy cow, I don't know how daily science fiction does that. Um, but but yeah, you know, it's just a huge volume. I don't know too many people that read all of our stories. See, I think that might be part of the reason why um, the awards, the Hugo nominations, happened the way they did. When you have a story every single day, it's hard for one to stand out. And back back in the day, and, and I don't want to sound like I'm nostalgic or anything. It's just back when you had Asimov's, you had base, you had your twelve issues and there was a standout story maybe in each issue so it's not that so much there were fewer stories to choose from but they kind of stood out for longer they were highlighted for longer mm. so maybe maybe that's uh, maybe that's it I don't know that could be that they had more time to sort of develop a so, yeah a groundswell of support them. yeah I mean you could have a fantastic story on uh, daily SF but it would have to be really really fantastic to hold people's attention and, and for people to say hey you should go and read this story that was five days ago right, so maybe, right. maybe that's it yeah you'd think that would make it easier though instead of saying hey you need to go down to your local drugstore and hope that they still have the October issue of Asimov's yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you can go online and read this story that was published in January today December next year yeah. But I, I do think it is a little diffused with people having so many choices that are um, have uh, in the library world we have a term that was introduced to us called friction. Mm-hmm. So they want to introduce uh, introduce friction between the public and the book borrowing process for electronic books. So with a online story there that fiction doesn't exist you don't have to get in your car and drive to your local drugstore and pick up a copy off the newsstand or you don't have to wait for it to come in the mail you can just read it on your computer on your device your phone so that friction so to speak is missing Mm -hmm. um so you have the opportunity i mean i i read i'm doing air quotes i read a lot of these magazines through their podcasts Uh so i'm listening to the stories and that makes it really easy for me because I don't want to listen to the radio in the car while I drive to work, so I listen to stories. Um, and I'm able to keep up with these magazines, whereas if I had to actually find time to read them, I might not be able to. So that's that getting sense. easier, too, with the Kindles and the Kobos and, mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff, right? You know, you can have them, you know, literally at, at your fingertips. And when you're done, you know, the the, the last issue of Asimov's, the, the new issue can be on the same device, right? You can immediately right. switch over to it. Um, what about submissions? Uh, I'm sure you get quite a few submissions, John. Uh, mm-hmm. What are your horror stories? Come on, lay it out. <laughs> <laughs> what should people be doing with submissions, but, but what don't they do? One of the things that always blows my mind is when I get a submission. I use an electronic submission system, so people log in and they submit the story through that. Mm-hmm. And then our readers... And myself, we log in from the administrative side and we are able to open up the stories and see things. And people submit stories without any contact information on them. <laughs> and it just wow. blows my mind that, you know, if, if you don't care enough about your story to put your name on it and a way for me to get in touch with you, why should I care enough to read it? Wow. So that's crazy. We, well, we've been in. Go ahead. You, you do you do edit a sci-fi fantasy publication? Maybe they would expect you have a little telepathy. You should know. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, it, it's the funny thing because yes, if I'm in the submission system, that has their name and email because you can't submit without using that. But it doesn't take much for me to get separated from that system. You know, should that system crash, so that I accidentally delete their submission, but I had saved the document somewhere. And I open it later, and I have no idea who made it. So you're saying that no matter what, in your actual submission, you should have title by name, no matter what, with contact I, information, just like the old days, the old, yeah, the I, old manuscript format. Yeah, and, and you know, again, I also come out of, uh, you know, I started working in publishing in 93, mm-hmm. so I, I come out of, you know, your paper background where you want to have double-spaced and two spaces after a period and <laughs> everything in a monospaced font so it looks <laughs> cleanly and you can count the number of letters and things. Um, I'm not such a stickler on some of that. Uh, if someone sends me something that's formatted really oddly, then we won't read it. But I want your name 
your address contact info on the first page of your submission. <laughs> so you can be blacklisted. <laughs> I just want to jump in here with that two two spaces after a period. That's that's a bit of a thing for me. My wife is dyslexic, and mm-hmm. and that makes it very difficult to read. Right. Yeah, that's her. that's old school. They don't. Um, that's very much being phased out. I know that uh, modern. Um, I mean, I know my publisher and typesetters and stuff like that are saying no. Just do one space after period now. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and they basically go through and we'll do a search and replace for the two spaces <laughs> and get rid of them, and it goes right direct to, old, yeah. uh, to one that, space. But that's a yeah. holdover from typewriters. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, <clears throat> exactly. Yeah, the reason they used to Excuse do that is because uh, when people are using typewriters, editors editors need a really strong definitive break between the sentences. And and the monospace font of typewriters didn't do that, so two spaces were in center. Were right. inserted. That's why italics was always indicated by an underline because you didn't have an italic right. typeface yeah. on your typewriter, but you could go back and underline a word and, and you also, double underline yeah. a word for bold. But we yeah, don't need and, 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 and also um, what, I, what I was always uh, told with the underline for italics is when a copy editor or whoever was going through this, the print. A version, it's easier to see the underline. It's easy to miss yeah. an italic when they were doing the typesetting and everything. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I, I like the future. <laughs> I like having everything come out formatted perfectly and all that stuff. <laughs> so do you have any uh, slush pile horror stories? This is something I always like to ask other editors when I meet them. Um, I, I'm sure I do. Um <clears throat> What what are some like things Put don't on the to, spot. To, to not from, do? From, yeah, from, do from the people who aren't homicidal maniacs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, typically, the things that I'll see, um, you know, things that have really slow openings. Uh, it's not really a horror story, but you know, you have a ten page story and it takes eight pages for the for things to develop. It depends yeah. on if you're editing for a living, whether or not that's a horror story. <laughs> right. Um. I don't know. Now that I have readers, a lot of that stuff I don't see anymore, um, which is nice. Um, the first 14 issues I did uh, entirely on my own with all the reading and editing and layout and everything. I think I've kind of blocked that from my brain. Um, <laughs> I always think of a story that came into Tor while I was there. I don't know. Oh, no, it came into, I'm sorry, to Asimov's. And it was set in a square in the center of the page so that was the text was formatted into a block in the center of the page <laughs> and, and it was eight or nine pages and it was all capitals and it was a story about Hitler and you went back in time and Hitler could fart different colors and all these different <laughs> things wow. Just, wow. like every time we turn the page you, you wonder am I still reading the same story because it doesn't seem to follow from the previous page <laughs> I was going to be a story about the the Borg. Is it not like the square stuff from yeah. Star Trek? <laughs> yeah, 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 the square like, stuff from Star Trek. <laughs> right? Just be all like locked in squares. Like that'd be brilliant. <laughs> Very well. cool. Okay, so um, what would you recommend uh, for people trying to break into the short fiction market? Do you have any recommendations? Again, besides write a great story, uh, can you give them an idea of how to learn how to write a great story? Well, one of the best ways, and you guys have touched on this before in previous podcasts, one of the best ways to learn what a market is looking for and what the the short fiction market is looking for is to read what's out there. You go and you read the types of things that are happening, and you can see what those editors are publishing and picking. Um, you know, read the year's best anthologies. They do a, a, a good job of selecting out some of the best things. And, you know, your new writer isn't going to write like uh, Ken Liu or... Um, uh, Jeffrey Ford or, or someone like that, but you can start to see the types of things that are happening. Um, yeah, I think writing with other people or having other people who can read your work and not your mom, not your, your best friend, you know, someone who you have faith that can be kind of objective. Um, I always tell people read stuff out loud, particularly dialogue. You see dialogue and you think no one would say that. You know, read it out loud. Can you read it out loud without stumbling? Because you, you know, your phrasing is is uh, not working there. So, like, a big thing is just you get someone else to read it because you know what you're trying to say, and your brain will put in everything that's supposed to be there. Sometimes it's not there. And if you have someone else read it, um, they'll pick those things out. But, you know, you have to be as much a student of what's out there 
as a student of the writing. So you need to know what is being published. And with all these things being online, it's so easy to go to the new issue of Apex and read their stories and say, oh, okay, that's what Apex has written. I like that kind of stuff. Let me go read some back issues. And uh, there's just so much stuff that's easy to get to these days for someone who wants to write short fiction. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, I was going to say the same. Really great point. I, were you going to say this, Dinah, that you have to read your markets before you submit? Yeah, and, and it's easier to, get to easier to do so, too. Uh, uh, like, like I said, you don't have to go down to the bookstore, the drugstore, or whoever to get the magazine. You can just dial, you know, go right online. I almost said dial up. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> dated myself. <laughs> you know yeah, what? Get a, do, do your research. Get a feel for what your editor, uh, what your particular editor uh, likes and wants. And uh, every magazine is going to be different and have its own flavor and tone. And mm-hmm. just, you're going to learn to be a better writer by reading anyway. We, we, like, like John said, we've stressed this in previous uh, episodes. Read. Uh, to be a better writer, read. And, and what I sometimes do is when I read something that I really like and that is just really written well, I take a notebook and I'll, like, really cool turns of phrase, I'll, I'll write them out. It's like, ooh, that's a really neat way of saying that. You can only say, I turned and looked at him so many times, and there's right. sometimes different ways of, of going about that and all that. And I love writing that down. It kind of helps it get into my mind. John, can you talk about um, going digital and what that's been like for you from where you sit? Like, how, how has that process been? The process of making an issue is essentially the same. And then instead of sending a file off to a printer, we just put it online. So that's pretty much the same. But the whole prospect of doing the promotion and marketing is very different and and need, I need to be more engaged, and that's where things have been more difficult for me because I moved from the East Coast to the Midwest, and we started having kids, so my time has become more... Uh, I have less free time than I had in the past, so it becomes more difficult for me to capitalize on you know, getting the new issue out there, and it's been a lot slower build. So when I went online, it was almost like starting over again and getting the word out again and, and uh, making sure people knew what it was. And I feel like now I'm kind of almost back to where I was when we were finishing up with the print. What about uh, your profit model? How has that changed? Um, that's a great question. Uh, there never has been a profit model. <laughs> I, was to ask, I was about to ask, are you losing less money or more now? <laughs> I'm losing less money because I'm spending less money. Um <laughs> One of the things, last year I ran a a Kickstarter to fund this year's worth of issues, and part of the process then was to get me the time to investigate ways to sell the magazine. One of the biggest avenues of that is the Amazon subscription service, which is no longer open to new submissions. So I'm not able to offer my magazine as a subscription through Amazon, unlike... uh, I know Lightspeed is there and Clark's World and Apex and a few other places who, you know, you do a dollar ninety nine an issue and you can get a couple hundred people who say, oh, I can do a buck ninety nine four times a year or once a month. And uh, that can fund a lot of your costs for the year. That's not there anymore. So you have to then again, I have to start over and find other avenues. Uh, Small Beer Press started Weightless Books, which is a the place where you can get subscriptions to my magazine. But there are also, you know, waitlist books isn't as well known as Amazon, so, you know, they're working on getting the word out about them. What about advertising? Do you do any advertising on the side or like No, that? I've, I wish I could. Advertising is prohibitively expensive. Um, oh. And that's why, this is something, a, a conversation I had with people eight years ago, maybe, you know, why do you always advertise in these other small magazines? And it's like, well, we can swap ads. If I look at doing Writer's Digest, I'm going to do a full page in Writer's Digest. It might be $1,500. It might be $5,000. And that's more than it costs to make the magazine for a year. So I can't justify spending that money. But what about, no, I mean, like selling advertising space on uh, on your site. Um, Have you ever done that? I've tried to do that with limited success. Again, that's going to come into the amount of time that I have to devote to right. to oh. finding people to do that and chasing after people. And I had uh, some of the people who helped me make the magazine. We've we've looked into doing that, but uh, this is something we all kind of do for the love of it. So when bills need to be paid, we all end up doing other things that generate that money for the bills. 
John, w- what's what's the story with Amazon not allowing new subscription model magazines and and so on? Like, why why is that? It was is that going to change or that was a program that was in beta, and then they said the beta is done. And uh, when I've written to them about it, I get sort of a a, a set answer that says that project is the program is no longer running. Uh, sign up if you want to know when it becomes available again, and I don't know when that's going to be. Wow, because that's huge. I mean, I'm sure those magazines get so much of their business. I don't know if it's the majority from that, but like I, I subscribe to Cars World on my Kindle, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm happy to support them, and it's it's great getting it on there. But I would think that would be crucial for you, like in a business like what you're doing. Yeah, that- it would be because you wouldn't have to have huge numbers. For something like what I do, if you had, maybe I'm being a little bit optimistic here, overly optimistic, but I would assume or feel like I could get a hundred people to subscribe. And if you had a hundred people subscribe or a couple hundred people to subscribe, which is what I had when I had a print subscription, that would cover the costs of making the issue. So with that missing, it's sort of chasing around trying to find a, a suitable replacement. So, oh, so you said you said you were with someone else now, uh, Smallville Press. What are they doing now? Well, that's just another place. So I'm selling the book electronically or the magazine electronically at Amazon and Barnes Noble, and then at Waitlist Books. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of the ebook store for Small Beer Press. Okay, but they can't subscribe the same they, way. Is that it? They have, they have they sell subscriptions, but it's not as easy as right. it is to buy your subscription on Amazon for the Kindle. See. So again, there's that friction that I was talking about before. There's mm-hmm. there's enough friction for people to they first have to know that waitlist exists, then they have to choose to go to a place other than where they're buying all the rest of their books, and subscribe there. So right. if, if they decide, well, then it's not on Amazon. I just I'll just read it for free online. So you kind of yeah. get stuck there. Um, but I've looked at the options for what I try to do is have the whole issue ready before I start putting it online. So then if you want to read the whole issue issue right away, it's a dollar ninety nine, you can get the whole issue. Or if you just want to wait, you can wait for it to come out over time. Um and I've had I don't know, it's hard to quantify those sales because they're growing, but they're still really small amounts for the number of sales I have through those places. And and for the most part, would you say that most short story markets run into the same kind of problems that you're running into? I mean other than those, you know, handful of few big ones? Yeah, they do, and they tend to be um, funded through other sources. So uh, you think of something like Tor.com. Tor.com is probably not making the money to cover the fiction that it publishes. Right. Um, yeah. So they take the money from you know the Wheel of Time books and take a small percentage of that and fund Tor.com. Uh-huh. Um, you know, even something like Lightspeed and Nightmare, there's likely a portion of that, while they do have subscriptions through Amazon, um, John Joseph Adams also sells anthologies, and he does well putting those out, and they, they're they successful, so some of that money is likely coming back into helping those magazines on a consistent basis. Um, again, I know John did a Kickstarter for Nightmare Magazine, so that was helping fund the first year's worth of issues, and uh, then trying to build up a subscription base and get that moving forward for him. Sorry, my magazine has lost money every year. It's been in going. I, I fund it through editing and writing, and you know, Cam- right. Camille and Camille and my other partner do the same thing. They they, they put money in for that. Um, yeah, short fiction is, is generally something that I find that people do for the love. There is there just isn't a lot of money in it because um, everyday fiction gets sixty thousand unique hits a month. Like it's just a huge number, right? Um, mm-hmm. And we have ads on our site, right? But people don't click them, you know. Like, yeah. well, part of the problem is Google AdWords, right? So that that uses AdSense, so it looks at the con- the the content of the story and then puts up ads based on that. So if if somebody <laughs> in the story swears and says, "Oh Jesus Christ" or something like that, then we get like ads for cults, 
and stuff <laughs> up top, right? And so, like, who's going to click that, right? See, see I think it's smart. The, um, the website Smart Bitch is Trashy Books. Mm. Uh, they advertise on their site, but they don't go through another service. They basically say, if you want your book listed on our site, you send us this much money, we'll put your book on. You know, they have various rates for a top or banner, you know, and stuff like that. Mm. And, and uh, as far as I know, they do, they do very well. Now, they have huge traffic, yeah. so that helps. And putting, I mean, and I've bought um, ad space with them before, and putting my book on their uh, their site, it, it, it works. Um, you know, I don't even worry about click throughs and stuff like that. I, I just want to get the book cover out there. So I'm wondering if that's something that short fiction magazines can do is, a, you know, basically seeing if authors want to advertise, that sort of thing. So we've done that fairly extensively, and part of our Kickstarter for Raygun Chronicles, which funded recently, uh, we raised eight grand for an mm-hmm. anthology. Um, nice. Wow, nice. Yeah, no, it was quite good. Brian Thomas Schmidt was our editor, and he's just phenomenal um, at, at promotion, like really amazing. And, it, uh, you know, a lot of the credit can be laid at his door. Um, but we part of that was we offered advertising space on everyday fiction, right, you know, because it does get a large amount of traffic. Um, you know, but again, I don't. we don't get an enormous number of click-throughs on those ads, right? For whatever reason, we have a fairly loyal reader base, right, and... You know, I mean, I guess they're, you know, interested in reading short fiction, right? They they don't. But even but even if someone doesn't click through, I mean, if someone doesn't click through, they they're still seeing the cover and going, oh yeah, hey, there's a new Diana Rowland book coming out soon. Yeah, but how do you or, or that sort that? of thing? How do we how do we? Well, well you can't basically, and and um, my attitude when I went to Smart Pitches is, is basically, uh, I figured that they have enough traffic that that many eyes were going to see the cover, and it was as useful as quantifying how many people are going to look at the cover in if I bought Ad Space and Locus or something like that. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I can't get the actual click-throughs, but it's all basically, um, you know, a crapshoot. We've um, kind of been skirting around an issue that I, I would like to, to clarify. Uh, we've said some things about professional markets and semi-pro markets and things like that, but what is a professional paying market? Um, I believe it's anything that pays over five cents a word. Is that right, John? That's how CIFWA defines a, a professional market. And uh, what are some of the uh, the pro markets that you think are the best for an author to submit to that's good for their career, um, good for them to get a, a, a jump start in the short fiction market? My favorite short fiction markets uh, that are pro-paying, uh, Clark's World is probably the one I like the best. Um and then Beneath Ceaseless Skies, which is uh, fantasy, uh, epic fantasy. Uh, I should almost look at the site to see what it says. But um, And Lightspeed Magazine are probably the top three for me. And Lightspeed recently, it started out as purely a science fiction magazine, and then John Joseph Adams acquired Fantasy Magazine from Prime Books and then folded the two together. So Lightspeed incorporates science fiction and fantasy stories. Mm. So those three markets are all pro-paying. Uh, Clark's World and Lightspeed are monthly. Uh, Beneath the Skies is fortnightly. Um, and they all have fast response times, which is nice for authors. You don't have to sit there and wait and wonder what's happening. Um, and those are all the three people that work uh, there as the editors are all good editors, so they will be able to help your story should they choose it. Um and the nice thing about those markets is that the editors in the field are also reading them. Um, so I'm reading them. Uh, the people at Strange Horizons are reading them. The editors of Apex are reading them. So they know who's publishing in these other places. So if you send a story and you say, I had a story in Clark's World, we don't say, Clark's who? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Um, you know what? Uh- I... I so, sorry to interrupt. Tom, my my friend Tom Crosso, he's a writer of the Future winner, and he's been nominated for Nebulas and stuff. He published a story in Clark's World, and one of the slush readers went to Penguin afterwards, mm-hmm. right? And she invited him to submit his novel to them. So, oh, that's cool. Yeah, so yeah. So yeah, no, when John's saying, awesome. yeah, when when you know they they get read by editors, not just other short fiction editors, but novel editors and major publishing editors also read those markets. Okay, I'd like to get everyone's opinion of the markets that say they'll pay in exposure. And I know that what my personal opinion of that is, but 
does anyone think that that is worth sending stuff to for beginning writers? The, yes. You know, half cent a word, and I'll, I'll pay you an exposure and that sort of stuff. Give me your thoughts. Well, yeah, I think that it is worth it. It depends on, you know, the uh, the prestige of the mag- magazine and what kind of reputation it has. But, yeah, I think that even some free markets are worth um, <clears throat> submitting to if uh, it means getting your name out there. So everyday fiction is a token-paying market. So I guess, you know, theoretically we're not free, but, you know, we pay $3, right? So that's not a lot, mm-hmm. even even if it is short fiction. Um and I, I have kind of mixed opinions about that. I think that the vast majority of these magazines cannot offer exposure. They say, we'll pay you an exposure. But if you look at the, the amount of traffic these sites get, it's very, very small. And out of that, few readers will remember the names of the writers involved. And these writers generally that, that you know get paid an exposure don't have anything to expose. They're not selling anything. Right, so so <laughs> it's like the people at Walmart. You don't want to see them. <laughs> well, no, I mean they might be quite good. They might be they might be it might be amazing fiction, right? But they don't have anything. Exposure only works if you're trying to sell something, right? So with everyday fiction, we always tell people, and part of your payment is that we'll put an ad in your bio for whatever you're trying to sell, right? And we get because we get a lot of traffic, right? You know. The, the actually the ads on our sites don't get a lot of click throughs but but the the author bios do get quite a number we had one author bio that had uh, 800 click throughs so oh, that's pretty wow. cool. yeah you know i mean that's quite that's that's quite good right and sometimes we we had a story that was read over a million times right it got picked up by all of the um the social media you know like center i think it was you know back when dig was big it was it was it, it made that and stumble upon and stuff like that so for that author you know, and many of our authors, sixty thousand uniques. That's quite a, that's quite a large number. Um, you know, they do benefit from exposure, but I, I think that writers forget you have to have something you're selling in order to benefit from exposure. So you have to be like, okay, well, this this story, you know, it's a short story. It's flash, so it, you know, you can write it in an hour or something, and then that's an ad for my book, right? But if you don't have anything that you're advertising, what what are you doing? Well, we've talked a lot about short fictions and short stories and all sorts of other things, but apparently short fiction is a long topic. So we're going to pick this up on the next episode as well. You get two shows with John Klima. Aren't you lucky? All right. We'll catch us next week for the rest of this episode. This has been another episode of Hide and Create. The show is produced by me, Jordan Ellinger. The site is edited by Joshua Esso. And your co-hosts have been Diana Rowland and Moses Sergar. That music that you're listening to was written by Jason Donnelly. We can be reached at writingpodcastonline.com, where you can ask us questions and suggest topics for future shows. Thank you for listening. Now go hide and create something.